Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. This message is for you because you matter to us. I'm Megan Brusicki, co-senior pastor of Community Church, and you're about to hear the truth of God's word in an encouraging way with practical steps to help you move forward. In fact, just by watching right now, you're on the path to living fully alive, and we want to help you. Check out community.church to experience the service live online or to get more info, or come join us at one of our locations. We'll save you a seat. Enjoy today's message. Well, hey, everybody, it's so good to have you in the house today. Welcome again uh, to Community Church. If you're new here today, my name is Michael, and I'm the senior pastor here. And man, I am so uh, just excited today to celebrate, uh, literally yesterday, hundreds of Community Church people out serving on Serve Day. Can we just give it up for, for uh, our church, for the other churches around? The... Uh, the humidity percentage in our cities right now is what, like 175,000%, I think, and uh, uh, you're probably uh, started sweating just walking out to church today, um, but it's so cool to watch people getting out and serving and making a difference, and uh, man, love that, love people that got to meet new people. Um, I'll talk about a couple things in, in a few minutes uh, here later today, but it was a lot of fun, every generation getting out and making a difference. Uh, last couple of weeks, we've heard some awesome messages. I just wanted to give it up uh, for both of them, even though they may not hear us clap. Uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Irene, and then last week, Pastor Sam. Can we just give up? I so, um, I so love uh, that we are blessed to have a church that is a team, and uh, that's what makes it happen every single weekend, from who communicates uh, to who serves all across the house, makes such a big difference. And so thank you all for jumping in and, and growing and uh, seeing what God would do. Uh, Suffolk Campus, it was fun to hang out with you in person last weekend, and uh, yesterday we actually did some cleanup work around the outside of our soon-to-be, uh, I'm just going to keep saying soon-to-be till we move into Holland Road, our permanent location for our Suffolk Campus doing some cleanup outside around that and excited for all that's coming there in the days ahead. Today we're uh, continuing the series we've been in. Uh, this summer we started a message series called Second Wind. Look at the person next to you say, Second Wind. And uh, we've been going through this book of the Bible, taking, uh, this is a long series for us, we don't usually do series this long, uh, going through this book of the Bible called Second Corinthians, where this guy named the Apostle Paul, he wrote, uh, he wrote this book of the Bible uh, to a church in an area called Corinth, and he wrote a second letter, and the, the reason is because he had more to say, and then, uh, it's true, and what's interesting about this book of the Bible and this study we've been kind of doing together this summer is we're learning that Holy Spirit is the one who gives us a second wind in life that makes us able to make it through anything every single day. Also learning that the reality is that living as a Christian in a world that is not Christian is not easy. And we need Holy Spirit. And that's what we're learning about it and kind of the definition we've looked at in this series for Second wind is it's the ability to perform at peak performance with less exertion. The ability to perform at peak performance with less exertion. And if you're here today, you're like me, I don't care what I'm talking about, that's what I want to do in life. I'm like, yeah, I want to be my best and have it not be as hard. I mean, come on, how many of you would like work out 16 hours a day if you're like, it'd just be great and it wouldn't really be tired and it'd just be amazing. It'd be so... 16 hours might be a stretch. Let me be more realistic. Like one and a half. Maybe that's more like, you know, but instead I just skip it because, you know. Today we're going to jump in and before I even get into kind of to the meat of today, as I was studying for this weekend, this one verse where I was going to start, it, it kind of jumped off and I want to, I want to, I guess set kind of a broad spectrum of understanding here today before we kind of zero in on what I think that God would want to show us uh, through our message. So let's jump in. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 10, the Apostle Paul is speaking, and he says this, here is my advice. I, I like that he's been talking to us for eight chapters, and he decides now to tell us what his advice is. So I like the Bible. He says this, it would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Amen. I'll pray, be blessed, have a great week. I mean, this guy, who, who, inspired by Holy Spirit, 
wrote this book of the Bible, talking about all the, all the difficult times that people have gone through. He understands he's gone through them. He understands the church is going through them. And he goes, hey, I, I, got, I got advice for you today. Finish what you started. Now, I want to be the first to admit that as I've been thinking for two weeks straight about this one part of this one verse, I have pretty much felt so much conviction and just like, why, God, do I not follow through in so many areas? So we're going to get help today. We, I am, and it's up to you if you want to, right? Here's my advice. Finish what you started a year ago. Before we get into more of what he talks about, I just want you to write down this note. Follow through. Follow through. It, it, I, I, think that, I think that if I want to live life with a second wind, I, I'm going to have to take some pauses throughout my days and throughout my moments and go, what has God told me to do? And when I say told me to do, because I'm, I'm praying, because I'm reading the Bible, because I'm engaged in small group, because I'm engaged in my church and in community, and I'm growing. And so not that I hear an audible voice, but inside, I, I know this is what God has said to do. I need to follow through. Now understand, there's always going to be, because I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, we won't reach perfection on the earth, there's always going to be things. There's always going to be aspects that we're going, I need to get better at this. I need to grow in this. At the same time, we always want there to be things where we're going, you know what? I'm following through in that area right now. And and it's a good time for us to think about follow through because it's July and it's the middle of the year. And so it's an opportunity for a lot of us to go, this is what my focus was going to be on last uh, January. And then to say, is that still my focus? Because follow through makes a difference. Like the follow through matters. I don't know how y'all play golf, but, but the follow through matters. You know, you can look great right here. You can look great right here. But if you don't have this picture X pose, I'm telling you right now, it's beautiful when I do it, just like that. The follow through matters. I love to play golf. And uh, I was playing out at Harbor, not Harborview, Riverfront Golf Course a few weeks ago, and I thought I was playing really good, and I was getting my follow-through well, and I was only going to play nine holes, and I was even par after four. And how my mind works, this will explain a lot about your pastor, is uh, if I, like, start well, like, I'm four holes even par, I'm like, I probably should think about, you know, trying out for, like, a PGA event, because (laughs) I feel like my game's really strong right now this year. And... um, And then I hit, I think, three houses on the next three holes. (laughs) And I know some of you live on that golf course, and so if it was your house, I apologize. But you know, I can tell you, because I've played golf for 20 plus years of my life, the follow-through is usually my problem. The follow-through is usually my problem. I I think the follow-through might might be, maybe that's, maybe that's some of our problems today. And so we're going to go into a specific topic, but I want to ask God, we're going to pray that not just now, but throughout the week, the Holy Spirit would truly speak to us and give us both the confidence and the boldness to follow through on those things God's told us to do. Lord, we love you. I thank you that you, you help us do this. And so I pray today that you would. I, I pray that in the, this week even, we would be able to zero in a bit more and truly experience um, the promise of follow through. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Here's why I think follow through is so important. You can write down the statement, success is sealed based on the follow through. It can start great, but success is sealed based on the follow through. Every single one of us have started something well in our lives. It's sealed based on the follow through. In fact, the truth is sometimes starting is just like having an idea. I love the saying, everybody who's ever taken a shower has had an idea. (laughs) You know, if you're a leader of an organization here today, I can say this obviously as the leader of this, this church, if you're a leader of an organization, people will love to share ideas with you. We all have ideas. What makes us add value is when we live a life of follow through. 
Young people, students today, if you want to add value uh, to an organization, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you feel this calling to do great things, the idea doesn't change things, the follow-through changes things. And so I encourage you today, think about the follow-through. Paul's going in right here, okay? And, and he starts here, here's my advice. We're going to go back in, and I want to finish this statement of chapter 8, verse 10 and 11, because it's really... I'm going to say troubling, but it just brings us insight into how God's system is different than any other system. So he says, here's my advice, back to verse 10. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Now, here's why I find that so fascinating. He's talking to people going through hardship. And he's carving out, essentially, chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians to talk about giving. There must be some tie in God's way of working that, that giving and generosity is a gift God gave me to make it through difficulty. See, there's no other reason we're tracking. And after we get through chapter 8, chapter 9, uh, in a couple weeks, I'm going to close out the series in chapter 10, uh, we're back to there's difficult thing. It, it, it's the same, same thread. You're going to make it through. This whole book of the Bible is about how things will come at us, and yet we can still live fully alive. And so he takes two chapters to talk about how giving can really make the difference. Well, he demonstrated it, verse 9. The Bible says that Jesus was the first and shows us what it looks like. It says this in the Passion Translation, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. For you have experienced the extravagant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was infinitely rich, he impoverished himself for our sake, so that by his poverty we could become rich beyond measure. If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, you have experienced the ultimate gift of what pure generosity looks like. Not only, understand this about our God, not only did he come to the earth, not only did he die on the cross, not only did he rise from the grave so that we could have life, what maybe we don't think about all the time is he was living the good life, meaning he had everything, it was all perfect, You don't leave heaven to come live on the earth for fun. You don't go from living in in a king's palace, if you will, to living in the servant's quarters for fun. He goes, you know what I want to do? I want to come all the way to the servant style of life so that I could help implement inside of people that by following me, you could experience what a true, full, king and queen style of life looks like. It's only when he came to the earth that that could start. And so Paul's talking to this church in Corinth, and he's talking to us today. And I think he's asking us, even if I just put it out like this, how you feel about giving? How do you feel about generosity? Now I realize in a church, if you talk about giving and generosity, and every time I talk about it, I say this, so if you hear it every time, forgive me, I realize that it brings up uh, multiple different emotions, and some people are like, you're looking for the right time to stand up and leave, and you're like, hopefully they won't say anything, you know, to me, and some of you are like, I'm going to check out now, because he said the word giving in church, and then some of you are like this, I, I want to I dive in and learn. What I want to tell you today is, I'm asking Holy Spirit to just speak to you. One of the things you should know about our church, you should know about me, uh, we're never going to ask you to give anything because we said. All we will ever do is ask you to pray and do what God told you to do because we know he knows what we need. And I, as a pastor, am not dependent on people. Do you hear that? You as people aren't dependent on people. We're dependent on God. And so as we all grow closer to God and obey him, he's the one, and I'll show you this in the scripture in a few moments, that supplies all of our needs. I think, though, what we need to capture 
is what does it look like to have second wind money? If the definition of second wind is performing at peak performance with less exertion, how many of you today would say, I would like that for my money? <laughs> Even if you're mad at me right now, you're like, no, that actually does sound like what I would want. I would want, I would want the, the, my financial position to do more with less. <laughs> Here's my advice. Now you don't want my advice. Do you know that's why Paul started with here's my advice versus talking about giving first? Here's my advice. Continue, follow through in this act of generous giving because it's only in the follow through that we experience the freedom. It's only when it, when it keeps going. Here's my advice. Keep trusting God. Keep being generous. Don't, don't, don't force yourself to live a life stressed about money when we don't have to live that way. I think that we wear ourselves out trying to get content by getting when generosity or giving is what makes us content. The word generosity and I'm going to show it to you in a verse in just a moment. It simply means this, the act of unselfish giving. What does it mean to be generous in life? It means you're an unselfish giver. Now, one of the things about our church, it's awesome, we're a church filled with unselfish givers. Because of generosity in our church, we do things like the month of love, where we give thousands of dollars, in it. We do, and we, we give hundreds of thousands of dollars outside of the church every year, but we give specifically to just make a difference in our community. We do things like that regularly. Why does that happen? Because we have a church filled with unselfish givers. What I have learned in this study and what I am find important as your pastor to teach you is that I think there's more that's supposed to happen in a life of generosity. And that's why Paul took two chapters in 2 Corinthians to talk about it. The Passion Translation of, of verse 10 through 12 says it this way. Here are my thoughts concerning this matter. He, he got less than here's my advice, I assume, in this passion, uh, translation. He said, you made a good start last year, both in the grace of giving and your longing to give. You should finish what you started. You were so eager in your intentions to give, so go do it. Finish this act of worship according to your ability to give. Verse 12, for, the, for if the intention and desire are there, the size of the gift doesn't matter. Your gift is fully acceptable to God according to what you have, not what you don't have. He's like, listen, this is not a comparison game. This, you know, there's this scripture, and I, I decided not to use it, but there's this scripture, I think it's, it's in Mark or Luke uh, chapter 12 or 14, read the Gospels and you'll figure it out too, but I don't remember off the top of my head, but somewhere it's written, and the writer of Hebrews said that, which is the excuse for why pastors can say that, and that's okay, that <laughs> while this widow was giving, uh, Jesus was sitting while, while the temple, while, while the believers were, were giving, offering, and he was watching what every single person put in. And he talks about how a widow gave less than everybody, but she actually gave more than everybody because it wasn't the amount, it was what it meant to her. Now, we don't, we don't sit, and we never would like sit and watch people drop money into buckets, right? But Jesus is who we do everything for. And, and Paul's speaking this, and here's what I like in verse 11. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't tell them how bad they are. He doesn't be like, dude, you stopped. He's like, listen, you, you were so eager. Let's keep it going. Like you, you had a great start. Let's keep it going. I don't know if you ever uh, work out or do something that one, well, you could just, you start something and you want to quit. <laughs> what makes me want to keep going is when I, come on, man, you started strong. You got this. I'm like, I got this. When somebody goes, hey, you are just blowing it and this is terrible and I really thought you'd be further along by now. <laughs> what do you wanna do? Then I'm out, this is dumb. Why am I gonna waste my time with this? So he's like, listen, you, you were eager, let's go. Let's, I need to encourage you guys, let's get this 
going because if you do, you will experience all God has for you. I have two statements I want you to write down and then I'm gonna show it to you in the scriptures. First is this, you can't outgive God, but you can be blessed beyond measure while you try. You can't outgive God, but you can be blessed beyond measure while you try. There is a direct tie, we're getting ready to show it to you in the scriptures, between our level of generosity for God, his church, his purpose, and the level of blessing we walk into in our life. It's just scripture, it's not pastor's opinion. You can't outgive him, because he gave, verse nine, chapter eight, we just read it, he gave the ultimate extravagant gift. Another statement to write down before I show you is this, there's no limit to what God will do through a generous people. It's not simply individual, it's all of us together. And Christian generosity, if you will, and this is what I think we're learning, is to flow from a a relationship with God, not religion. It's from a desire to see him move in and through our lives. Megan and I were just talking with some leaders in our church the other night about this, and when Megan and I talk about this topic, The reason it's, I guess I would say, so meaningful to us is we did not start teaching or talking about God's way of money when we became pastors. We we lived God's way of doing money and talked about God's way of doing money when we had corporate jobs. We we did it when Megan was a stay-at-home mom and we were figuring out how we were going to make it because his way just works. Here's how, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Here's my point, he's getting direct. Advice, now his point. A stingy sower will reap a meager harvest, but the one who sows from a generous spirit will reap an abundant harvest. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves hilarious generosity. Why we laugh, clap, cheer when we give every single weekend. God loves hilarious generosity. Do you know when you give and you're smiling on your face and you're like, "Woo, yeah, I'm dropping that in there. Yeah, I'm giving today. The Bible says God loves it. It's not like I checked the box to do something. God goes, I love that. Yes, here it is, verse eight. God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of. I, I, think that, I, think that, I think it was mentioned last weekend. I've mentioned it in past weekends where we'll talk about all and we'll talk about everything and we really like it when we're like the Holy Spirit will help you in everything and he will and we'll talk about how God's gonna help us in all these ways and he will and he goes, hey, listen, if we practice the art of generosity, God will overwhelm you, not just in grace, but in everything, which is why this is the hardest one to get. Because nothing in the world says this is true. Only God. Only God says this is true. He says, if you do this, you will be overwhelmed more than enough of everything, every moment and in every way. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do do. I feel like we're all there. Two messages. The first one was finish what you started. Those of us that got off the floor from that slap, we're now thinking, (laughs) right? (laughs) Come on, you know there's a few of us. I'm the first in that list, so that's how I feel. And then we're going, no, I, I want this. So I wanted to do this for us today. I, I read a, a longer expansive list in this in, uh, in a John Maxwell leadership book, but I kind of just, I shortened it and I wanted to kind of show the difference, I feel like, of what does it look like to, to be stingy versus what does it look like to be generous? Uh, because even generationally, there's, it meaning over the last 75 years, there's been different moments, I think, generationally where, where generosity has been celebrated and where stinginess has been celebrated. Now, I don't think we use the word stinginess. There's other words that we use that we feel like have a more positive or nicer meaning. Um, but I wanted to just kind of break it down. So I've got this chart. I think, I think yep, there we go. So uh, 
Here's the difference, and this is opportunity, stingy versus generous. This is the opportunity for all of us to sort of do self-evaluation. That's the purpose of this chart. So if we look at it, a stingy person is defensive, a generous person is offensive. Just think about it. Am I, am I more like protect what's mine, or am I more like I wanna go make a difference? Stingy people don't wanna lose, generous people wanna win. Come on, that will split a room like that when you go, am I the person who doesn't wanna lose or am I the person who wants to win? Stingy people hoard. Telling you right now, like they will help your marriage if you stop hoarding, whatever it is, I promise. Generous people, man, they just, they release it. Why, because we're, we're counting on God being the one who could bring it back. Uh, stingy people are reactive, generous people are proactive. This is a, this to me, and this is why it Im- impacts all of our life, right? You can evaluate. Am I more the person who reacts quickly to everything? Yeah, with my money, but also in an argument. Yeah, in a moment. Or am I more the person who is proactively thinking about how could I have right responses when it would come to my attitude and to my giving? Stingy people play it safe, generous people take risk. Come on, risk takers, this is where we get to unite in Jesus' name, or like, yes. And here's what's so funny, because I am talking about money, nobody's gonna raise their hands except for like three people, but it's still really, you know, the, the risk people are like, yes, I like to try things for God, because I believe by faith people do great things uh, for my life. This isn't a question of do you love God or not? Can I be clear? This is not a question of your salvation if you're a follower of Jesus here today. This is really a question of the meaning money has in your life and the impact that it's having on your life. Last couple ones, stingy, a a stingy view of money will be narrow and closed, generous is wide and open, stingy view will be maintain the status quo, generous will be vision for the future. Where are we at? We stingy, we generous. Because my Bible says that God brings blessing to the generous. And let it be reminded right now, It's not the amount that matters. It's the meaning. God is not looking at any of us going, well, you gave that amount, therefore you're blessed, but you only gave that amount, therefore you're not blessed. No, he's looking at our life going, I want, if it means something to you, then it matters. It means it's not the spare. If your friend needs to borrow a tire for the car, And you're like, no problem, you can just use my spare, just don't go over 40 on the highway. (laughs) You can use it as long as you want. I'm like, hey, that's great, do you have something that I could go over 65 on the highway, where that's the appropriate marked speed limit? (laughs) Why, Why? because I don't want this, I don't just want the spare. I, I I I want the good. I want what's gonna work the way it's supposed to Work, and God goes, if you wanna like sow in with your money, if you wanna sow in, if you wanna give and expect what God promises in his word back, he's going, I just don't want your spares, your leftover change. Oh, I found 50 cents in the console, and ice cream cones are 75 cents, therefore I can give this spare. No, he's like, if it has meaning to you, then I can put my blessing on it. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says it like this, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. A generous person prospers. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. This weekend and all month long, in in our in our time and in our giving, we as a church we're we're practicing Proverbs chapter eleven, verse twenty five. How are we practicing it? Well, we're, give, we're giving of our time. Some are giving more money. And we're seeing people be blessed. And even when it's, you're sweating to death, you yourself are refreshed. You feel encouraged by what's happening. But it's a team thing. I wanna show you this example here today uh, for why, why we can do this. And I'll go ahead and take all this up with me right now if I can. So, um, I'm not a scientist, but I read this example and I thought it was amazing. So that doesn't mean anything to you, but it will in a moment. So what I have here is a paper cup. And I wanted to try to give some understanding today about why I think this is significant 
for a local church in what the Apostle Paul's talking about. And so if you're here today for the first time or you're just stopping in to check out our church, uh, I, I think what I'm talking about, I'll, I'll, this whole service will, will help your life. But specifically right now, I'm talking to those of you that like community church is your church. And you're, you're part of it, you believe in where we're going and what we're doing as a church. Uh, you're, you're not just stop in for 10 and then out the door. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you and talk about why it's so important for us to understand how this makes a difference. When Paul is talking in 2 Corinthians, he is talking not to one person, he's talking to a church. And I think he's, he's talking about the significance of what happens when we live a life of generosity, especially in the face of difficult seasons and difficult times. He's talking to all of us because the power of generosity is when we do it together, not on our own. So for instance, this is a paper cup right here, and um, I, I want you to pretend with me that, uh, that we all have our own paper cups, and we all have whatever amount of money we uh, want to have inside of our paper cups that we think is the right amount, and we want then to say, I'm going to be generous my way with my money so that God can bless me the way I want to be blessed, simply meaning how I want to live my life is I want what I want when I want it so that my life could be what I want it to be. How many of you will just want to admit at first this is the biggest obstacle in life to overcome because this way God can help us. When this happens, we're on our own. And the problem is one cup by itself doesn't really have the power to sustain. If you didn't see it, it smashes because it's just one. The beauty, though, is that when multiple people stand together, now I'm 200 and <laughs> regrettably, I've gained about seven to 10 pounds this year, and in Jesus' name, I'm gonna take it back off. This is part of the follow-through part that is very disturbing to me, <laughs> just letting you into my own world. Somewhere between 225 and 232 is probably what I weigh in this moment. There's about 18 cups, and I appreciate those of you that already in your mind, you're like, wow, he doesn't look like he weighs that much at all. I know, you always say that, and I appreciate that so much. It means a lot to me. Um, <clears throat> but so I began thinking, why is it so important that we come together generously? Because one cup is gonna get smashed. But the power is when multiple people come together, not pray to God this example works right now because I'm in front of you. <laughs> when multiple people come together, 225 pounds can stand on some paper cups and not get smashed. Why does this work? Because the power is when we come together generously, we can have a greater impact and we can build something greater for God than any of us could ever do on our own. Yeah. Which is why he says, would you come together to build generously? So we do this thing. And again, I'm talking to our church. We do this thing called the generosity team. It's why you got a card when you came in today called the generosity team. What I'm asking you to do with that card as I'm asking you to pray. And the generosity team is for people, like Paul is talking about, who sow, who give generously. Generosity is when I give financially above the tithe. The tithe is, if we just tried to cookie cutter this for you, the scriptures would teach the tithe is for your blessing. God says, test me in this, give 10% to the, to the storehouse, the local church, and as you do, what you'll watch happen is I'll pour out blessing on your life. Paul then begins to talk to us about a second step in 2 Corinthians of generosity. And when the church comes together and is generous, and it's what he's talking about, the church is able to build more, is able to reach more. So we as a church, we, we, have, we have a great uh, finance budget team, we manage our money as a church healthy and well. We are building out a campus that will be a permanent location in Suffolk. Our hope, our goal is that we can do that uh, for as little if no debt possible. And so my hope is that God would speak to people to say, I wanna be a part of the generosity team. And it's a one-year commitment on that card that I'm asking you to, to just pray and say, God, what would you have me give 
over and above my tithe this year, between now and the end of June, next, next summer. And, and to be real honest, I'm not even gonna say an amount today because I want you to pray and I want you to just write down whatever God would put. And you can drop it in an offering bucket. We would like to know just so there's a level of kind of ex- expectation of what people are saying they're gonna, they're gonna give. But don't, to this week, next week, the next week, we'd just love for you to drop it uh, off and just say, hey, this is, this is who I am. This is what I'm, this is what I'm committing to give. And uh, I'm gonna send you a thank you personally uh, just for saying, hey, I'm gonna be a part of this team to help us do more. Here's one more verse for why I think this is so significant. Verse 10 says this, this generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10, This generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, meals, is even more extravagant toward you. First, he supplies every need plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you give, as you sow, so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. It's all what God gives us is all what God gives us. And I believe the life of doing our finances God's way and the freedom is that even when it feels like my world is going crazy around me, if I will step in and sow and be generous, I'll watch how God blesses my life. Something that I do, and I I was thinking about this, uh, well the truth is I was having an idea while I was taking a shower because that's what we all do. But uh, when I want something, I've learned that if I instead give more, God will often give me what I wanted with less stress. We as a church right now, we're, 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 we're building out a campus. We are giving money to other churches who are planting churches right now. We're not hoarding it ourselves. We're, we're literally, just in the, last, in the last two months, wrote, two checks for thousands of dollars to help other churches that have one campus move from a portable location to a permanent location. And you should give yourselves hands for that real quick because you do that. <laughs> it's how God works. We, we sow, we, we invest because I believe this about our God. He is the God, write this down and we'll pray, of plus more. He's plus more. He goes, I'm gonna give you everything. I'm gonna give you everything and then the seed is still gonna multiply. And I'm not talking about the weeds in the flower bed. I'm talking about good. I'm talking about the desire of your heart, good. He goes, you can trust me. You can trust me. And what I know as a local church is when we come together generously, God is building this this platform, literally, for Hampton Roads and for beyond, there's only one thing that Jesus spoke about in all of the scriptures that will stand the test of time, and it's the local church. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. There's one thing we can be generous towards, and it's God's house. And he says, it is what will stand. Would you close your eyes with me? Lord, I thank you that you're an extravagant giver. I thank you that you give us more (laughs) than we deserve. Lord, I pray right now for those who are even just processing. Would you speak to their hearts in Jesus' name? Would you bring revelation and understanding to what you're saying to them and what their next steps would be? Holy Spirit, would you speak? God, I pray for anybody watching right now, anybody sitting in our Suffolk location, our Western Branch location, watching online, you hear my voice right now and the truth about you is you've not received God's extravagant gift of life. You know that and here's how you know you haven't received it, because you're living your life striving to perform, hoping God will be pleased. And when we receive his life by putting our trust in him, we get to live a life free from striving and instead get to live from having received his grace and his love. If you're here today and you know that's you, I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and I invite you to repeat this prayer with me today if 
If you know you need to receive his gift for the first time, for the first time in a long time, he gave life for us on the cross. If you're already a follower of Jesus, repeat this prayer with me as well. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me, for helping me. Today, I put my trust in you. I receive forgiveness. I receive grace. And God, I thank you that you have me in every single moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise one more time.